Hello, I'm Otto Schnurr. I'm a software engineer at TechSmith. This series of videos was made possible by the innovation time that TechSmith offers its software development staff. But the opinions that you're going to hear in this video are my own. They do not necessarily reflect the opinions of TechSmith. OK? So with that out of the way, I'd like to take a step back and go way back to the beginning of my career. So this is me, fresh out of grad school and wet behind the ears. Uh, after going to an interview at Motorola Labs in Chicago, I managed to get hired into their speech processing research lab. So these are people who are working on things like speech compression and speech recognition. And there was also another team there that had been working on a problem for a while where they were trying to use neural networks to get computers to talk more naturally. So this would be text-to-speech synthesis. It was a handful of people, six to seven people, a combination of linguists and engineers. The leader of that team had a PhD in electrical engineering, and the thesis of his PhD centered around the efficient computation of neural networks on conventional hardware. And this was in the mid-90s. And when he added me to his team, I ended up helping him port his PhD thesis from C to C++, was able to help run experiments, and I worked on that project for about three years. Um, it was really exciting and quite a lot of fun. So in terms of how this text-to-speech system worked, it would take text, which is written words, and that would go into a linguistics module, which would figure out how that text was pronounced. And that pronunciation was represented with phonemes. And this was important because uh, a given word could be pronounced more than one way, depending on how it's being used and things of that sort. And the neural network engine worked quite well. So the team ended up using neural networks throughout the system. So another thing that the system would do is for each sound, it would decide how long each sound was. And if you think about it, the timing of what you say has a lot to do with making you sound like you. And so that was another important aspect of the system. And so when you take these pronunciation and timing, that would then go into another module that was an acoustics module that would take that information and turn it into acoustic parameters that could be easily turned into audio. And that acoustics module was a recurrent neural network with about 200,000 weights, and it would execute 100 times a second to synthesize speech in real time. So that's the kind of system we were looking at. So back in episode one, we talked about labeling data for training machine learning models. And this text-to-speech engine was the same thing. Um, to do this stuff, the team needed data. But back at this point in time, data sets like this just weren't available. So the team had to build it themselves. And what they wound up doing was recording one of our colleagues. I think it was about 40 minutes or so of speech. And then one of the engineers on the team spent a really long time, uh, almost on the order of a year, doing torturous labeling of all of that audio, identifying where the sounds were and where the boundaries were, so that we would have labels like phonemes and durations of the phonemes. So when you set up a text-to-speech system in this way, the result is that this particular text-to-speech engine sounded like our colleague. It sounded like someone with a Midwestern American accent speaking English. The team did some um, user studies, and we found out that our text-to-speech engines scored a lot better in, in terms of naturalness. So our engine sounded a lot more like a human being. And where our text-to-speech engine was having trouble, or was having challenges, was that it scored worse in terms of intelligibility. So even though it sounded more like a human being, it was harder to understand what that human being was saying compared to the more robotic text-to-speech. So the linguist decided to run an experiment, and the results of this experiment just kind of blew my mind. It's something I've never forgotten, and I haven't really encountered another technology that does this kind of thing in the 20 years since I worked on this project. So what they decided to do is they took the, this acoustics module. Instead of using those phonemes to sound out English words, they used the phonemes to sound out French words instead. And the result was the speech that came out that sounded like someone trying to speak French with a bad American accent. And it wasn't just any American accent. It was someone with a Midwestern American accent who was trying to speak French. So the thing I kept thinking about was, let's say hypothetically for some reason you were aiming for this type of result. You wanted a text-to-speech engine that would speak French with a bad American accent. The thought I kept thinking is, how would you ever program something like that by hand? Or even if you could, even if you somehow figured out 
how to program that type of result by hand? Would you really want to do it that way? Or would it make more sense to hand that kind of problem off to a different type of software process that figures out the solution directly from the data and hands it back to you when it's done? So because of that result, and because of all these new results that are showing up now, now that uh, machine learning has really caught on and is much more part of the mainstream than it was back in the 90s, there's an outcome for this technology that's kind of hard to ignore. And it's a realization that I've eventually come around to. In fact, I would say it's the main thesis behind this series of videos that I'm going to offer and put in front of you. What I'd like to suggest is that software created with data instead of created with code is eventually going to become the most valuable kind of software. Now, for a lot of software engineers out there, like myself, this is a really distressing idea. And the truth of the matter is, I really like writing code. It's uh, something that is challenging and rewarding. And I don't really want to see it turn into something where my role is reduced to being a data jockey and machine learning is writing all the software. So I understand this concern, and I understand where it comes from. but Let's calibrate it a little bit, because when you think about it, changes like this are not new to software development. Our industry has encountered changes like this before. If you go back to the beginning of how software used to be written in the early days, you had a central processing unit that had an instruction set, and you had to know what that instruction set was, and it was numeric. From there, assembly code was a big step up, because now the numbers were replaced with words and variable names, and as antiquated as it might seem, a lot of software was written with that development stack. One of the places I worked at after Motorola was Midway Games, which was also based in Chicago. And I remember being amazed at finding out how many of their arcade games that they manufactured even in the 90s were entirely done in assembly code. And so after assembly code comes the ability to write software in a programming language. And so at that point, I don't need to know what the instruction set is for a central processing unit in order to write software for a given set of hardware. That level of detail has been effectively abstracted away. So instead of seeing source code as a displacer, I think a more interesting way to look at it is to think of source code as an enabler. It enabled people to consider solutions that they might not have considered otherwise with assembly code. And I think machine learning is going to be a similar kind of thing. So another way I'd like to look at machine learning is with a thought experiment. So imagine that an alien race has shown up from some other part of the galaxy and has decided to take over our planet. But they're not going to do it with disease or with weapons or some kind of army. They just have this magic ability to snap their fingers and all database technology disappears from the planet. So we all wake up tomorrow, we go to work, and we're not able to use any of our database technology. So business owners can't query inventories, and imagine what happens to a company like Google or Twitter or Facebook if they could no longer have access to their databases. So the point of this is, is that it can be easy to forget just how absolutely critical databases are um, to information technology. It forms a foundation for a lot of services and a lot of businesses. But does that mean that all software developers are database programmers? No. I mean, some are, but there are a lot of software developers that write all kinds of different types of software that have very little to do with databases. So one really simple way we could look at all this is to look at software in terms of components where you have a database technology that is probably important to a business or service in some way, and then there's source code that makes use of that technology and a lot of other things to build the software product or service. So the thing I like to suggest here is that machine learning might be a similar kind of thing. It's a new type of component that we can add into this mix. So in addition to database technology, that's important. There might be some features of some types of products where machine learning technology might make sense because it can enable a new type of capability that couldn't be easily done before. So that's kind of where I've struck a balance in my thinking about this between these two competing ideas. The first one being that I think machine learning is going to become a very important part of software development. But at the same time, I don't think it's going to take over all facets of what software development is about. So the barrier of entry for machine learning just continues to get lower, particularly in the last few years. So 
What I'd like to do now is show you an example of that. So what we have here is a collection of images from a Kaggle competition. Kaggle.com is a place that hosts machine learning competitions where people can train their machine learning models and submit them and see how they do. And in this particular training set, we have about 10,000 images of dogs that cover, uh, that cover roughly 120 different breeds. So what I've done here is I've taken this training set of 10,000 dog images and I've rearranged them into a particular type of directory structure. So if we open up this dog images folder, we'll see a bunch of subfolders underneath there. And each subfolder name is the name of a dog breed. So let's take a look at a couple of these images. So if we go down here and look inside this Beagle subdirectory, we see a bunch of images of beagles. And let's head back out here and go down a little further. If we go into this boxer subdirectory, we'll have images of dogs that are boxers. Okay? So that's the basic idea. So here we have an Xcode playground that's running on the Mac, and it has a framework in it that Apple released in 2018 called CreateML. And CreateML is designed to be able to train certain types of machine learning models. And it turns out that an image classifier is one of the types of models that it is able to train. So we're going to give that a try. So what I'm going to do is write a few lines of code here. And now that the code's written, we're going to go ahead and fire it up in the playground. And you can see when it starts running, over here it says drop images to begin training. So we're going to take this folder with all these dog images in it, pick it up, drag it over, and drop it into the tool. So now this training process has begun, and we're seeing all these dog images going by. And what's kind of funny in sci-fi movies, when we see images like this flying by, we're not really supposed to know what's going on. But what I'd like to say is by the end of this video series, you're going to know what the computer is doing here because we're going to walk through it step by step. So as you can see, we've got a lot of dogs here. So many dogs. We don't just have different breeds of dog. We've got different camera angles, different lighting, different backgrounds. Some of the pictures even have people in them. There's just a lot of variation. And the goal of the training here is to create a machine learning model where we can feed it new pictures of dogs that it hasn't seen before, and it takes a guess at what the dog breed is. So the question I'd like to pose again is, even if you could manually write code that somehow figures out how to go after this problem, somehow you assembled an army of computer vision techniques to guess at the breed of each of these dogs, would you really want to do that? Or would it make more sense to hand this data over to some other type of process that works on it and then lets you know when it's done. So let's go ahead and time lapse the recording here and get to the end of this training process. So here we finally finished training and what's interesting is that we've come up with a machine learning model that has an accuracy in the 60 percent range and that's not great, and if I were a more savvy um, presenter, maybe I would stop the recording at this point and try something else that would have more impressive results at the end. And truth be told, if you do this problem and only attempt to classify a handful of dog breeds, like five or six, you get a accuracy in the high 90% range. But I'd like to stick with this model with the 60% result for a couple reasons. The first reason is I'd really just like to try and stay on the anti-hype side of this fence and try to avoid the temptation of hyping this technology by cherry-picking some other type of experiment that has a better result. Because the truth of the matter is, it, it's not uncommon to run into a result like this, and depending on the time and resources you have available, one productive way of looking at something like this is looking at it as a starting point instead of an ending point. So if we have more time and energy to devote to this problem, we can say, well, out of the box, we got 60%. What other options do we have with the tool? Are there other tools? Are there other algorithms? That kind of thing. And the second reason I'd like to stick with this model is because it can be interesting to take a model like this for a spin and see for ourselves where it's having trouble. Are there some types of dogs 
that it has an easier time classifying than others. Just being able to see that for ourselves and get a sense of where the limitation and the difficulty is can be an interesting exercise. And so that's what we're going to do next. So I'm going to take this image classifier file and rename it to dog classifier. And then I have a custom iPhone application that I wrote in Xcode. I'm going to open that up and we're going to take this model file and we're going to drag it in and drop it into this iPhone application. Here you can see the input image of, you see scale it to 300 by 300 and it will output a class label indicating what it thinks the image is. It can also indicate um, a number indicating how confident it is with its prediction. And to integrate it into the app, I have this simple little registry here, and I'm going to add an entry to it, call it a uh, dog classifier, and I'm going to use the name of the uh, model file that you saw earlier. And one thing I like to point out here is that we have two other image classifiers in the registry. A ResNet 50 is a generic image classifier that can classify over a thousand different things, and the Google Net Places image classifier is able to classify locations. Xcode is now going to install and launch the app. And what we see here is the camera on this iPhone feeding frames of video to a machine learning model. And since we put the dog classifier first in the registry, right now it's feeding frames of video to the dog classifier. But before we dive into that, let's go ahead and switch to this other generic image classifier called ResNet. ResNet 50 was trained on an data set called ImageNet. It turns out when CreateML creates a custom image classifier, it ends up building it on top of this generic classifier. And we'll be talking about that in more detail in another episode. Now we've got ResNet hooked up to a live camera. And often a machine learning classifier will indicate the level of confidence it has about what it's predicting. So when you take a machine learning model and have it execute around 15 frames per second, this confidence measure almost acts like a Geiger counter. It can go up and down. And so in addition to us seeing what the image classifier thinks it's looking at, we can also see how confident it feels about what it's looking at. And these confidence values are bursty. They can kind of jump around. So what I've done is I've dampened this confidence reading kind of like a decibel meter on an old stereo system. Here we have a mouse. Depending on the angle, it does a pretty good job of recognizing that. Here is a door handle that it's having a hard time recognizing. It's, it's indicating it as a switch of some sort. So it, it is confused about that. Here's a ballpoint pen. And this I thought was kind of funny. This stapler, when you give it the right angle, it thinks it's a Polaroid camera. And bananas, it seems to do a pretty good job. Pretty confident about bananas. Coffee mug does a reasonable job. This is a ball, and it probably does not have some, something in its training set for this, so it's guessing that it might be a sea urchin or a puffer fish. And I thought this was really interesting because it's the most confident I've seen the model. It's just 100% sure this is a light switch. So maybe light switches are easy for it to recognize. Now let's go ahead and change the machine learning model to the dog classifier that we trained earlier. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this coffee table book that's called The Doggist. And what that's going to let me do is point the camera at a variety of different dogs. So the first dog we're going to try here is a French bulldog named Peanut that's four months old. So when we point the camera at Peanut, we're able to see that the classifier is able to identify Peanut as a French bulldog, which is pretty impressive. If you think about it, the classifier has 120 different possibilities to choose from, and in this case, picks the French Bulldog. And it's interesting to kind of zoom in to see which parts of the face help the classifier. Here's a German Shepherd. Interesting case here is if we lose the nose, the classifier has a harder time classifying it. Here's an English Setter. And when we're panned out, it's not quite as sure, but as we move in towards the face, as we close in, it gets more and more confident that it's an English Setter. So the face is kind of important for that. Dexter is an English Bulldog. And the classifier has a really hard time with him. Great Dane, St. Bernard, it's not sure. 
So this is one of the dogs it was having a hard time with. Here's a Doberman, which the classifier seems to have an easier time with. Here's another picture of a Doberman. And when we back out, it's pretty confident about identifying it. And if we move in, the, the confidence goes down. So it's almost like the light-colored fur further down is an important feature for identifying a Doberman for this model. Here's a Dachshund called Bella. And what's interesting with Bella is that our classifier really has no idea what kind of dog she is. I mean, once we move in on the ear here, it could say, well, maybe it's a golden retriever, which is reasonable if we're that close. But, you know, as we pull back out, it just really doesn't have a good idea of what kind of dog Bella is. Maybe it's the sweater, I don't know. And here is Oliver, a golden lab. Now, I grew up with a golden Labrador, so this is kind of an iconic dog for me. It looks like um, the eyes on a Labrador are kind of iconic as well, and it seems like Classifier is able to use those eyes as a way to identify what breed it is. Vizla, did I say it right? I'm sorry if I'm butchering these pronunciations here. It looks like the face is an important feature for the Vizla. Here we have a three-year-old beagle named Dash. And what's interesting here is we have another case of where the classifier is having a hard time. It can't decide between walker hound and a beagle. They're kind of neck and neck. Here we have a one-year-old Siberian Husky, a kind of unique looking dog. So maybe a little bit easier to classify. Now if we move into different features like the ears or the nose, the confidence goes down. But when we back out and have them all together, it seems to help the classification. So I'm usually not the kind of person who goes out and flaunts their artistic skills and videos. Actually, in terms of programmer art, this really isn't that bad. And this brings up a whole different kind of question that we're really not going to dive into right now. Is it possible for a machine learning model to have vulnerabilities that can be exploited? Yep, it is possible. So that brings us to the end of episode two. The next video, episode three, is going to start looking under the hood and diving into a little more detail about how machine learning works. So if that sounds interesting, please subscribe. You can also find more information at my blog, deepdojo.com. Thanks again. I'll see you next time.